Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome from the Aspen Institute Germany and the Aspen Institute UK. It's only two days until the G7 summit in Cornwall. And uh, under the United Kingdom's presidency, uh, leading democracies will convene under the catchy title, Build Back Better. And to get a better understanding of what to expect from the summit and what it's actually all about, I am very delighted to have two experts with me here today for a short Q&A session. First, we have Penny Richards, the Managing Director of the Aspen Institute UK. Hi, Penny. Hi, and we have Sturmi Annika Miltner, the Executive Director of the Aspen Institute Germany and a member of the G7 Economic Resilience Panel. So Hi. let's start right away. Hi, um, Penny, what is this year's summit all about? I think there are two different issues here. The obvious things it's about and, and what the ministers and my prime minister have been talking about are, are three different things. They're keen to attack and get some consensus on global trade. They're determined to strengthen the international system when it comes to um, looking at future pandemics. And they're also very keen to make some really significant strides in tackling climate change. But I also think it's more than that. I think it's also about seeing proper leadership and guidance from these democratic nations. I think it's about setting standards and um, looking at a set of values. And I also think it's an incubator for ideas. I think it's very rare, and especially in the last year and a half, as we know, to bring these significant leaders together. So I think it's a forum for those ideas as well. And lastly, I also think it's really important for a sort of a new approach to transatlantic relationships. We, we know we've had a a uh, febrile time in the last four years with a presidency um, under Trump in the US. So with the new presidency of, of President Biden, I think we're seeing a different reconvening of uh, the transatlantic relationships. Uh, thank you very much, Penny. And the next question goes to Stormy. Stormy, what role does economic resilience play in the summit agenda? I think it plays a pretty big role because it picks up on a lot of the issues which this Penny referred to. Um, there wouldn't be economic and social resilience without climate protection, for example, or for um, example, without protecting our biodiversity. So it plays a really big role. And why does it do so? Because we made a lot of um, very painful experiences over the last years, and particularly since the start um, of the uh, pandemic. Um, we have seen that our societies and our economies are very vulnerable um, to risks, not just uh, risks pa of pandemics, but also climate risks. And, and this desperately needs to be addressed. Um, so I think the uh, motto of this uh, of the summit uh, to build back uh, better or to build forward better, um, it's spot on um, because we really have a lot of homework to do and we need to cooperate internationally a lot more than we have done over the last three to four years. So I very much hope, Penny, that you are right, that the G7 is going to be an agenda setter again, um, as well as a forum for concrete action. Thank you, Stormy. Um, and we heard that uh, the UK is hosting this year's uh, summit. Um, what are the goals of the UK presidency? Again, I think there are official goals and I think there are unofficial goals mm -hmm. and the, the official goals are, are pretty clear. Um, the UK government is also hosting the COP26 meeting later in November. And so there is an absolute determination to get some really quite ambitious commitments from G7 nations towards climate action, making sure that, in fact, uh, Prime Minister Johnson has, he's very good at catchy titles and he, he's talking about a greener, more prosperous future. And actually the UK government has huge support amongst the British people um, for this topic. And they're seen, I think, very much as a world leader in, in climate change agenda. They're also determined to get some commitments on equitable access to vaccines for um, this year, um, and particularly in, in improving global health resilience, which again is very important. And there are a few other things, you know, so global economic recovery from the pandemic as well as vaccines. And also, I think they're very keen to work out a new type of relationship with China. We can't just be attacking China. It has to be making sure that the G7 countries can, um, can engage China in a, in a constructive manner as well. But I also think there are, you know, the, the side issues, I think, are also very important to the UK government. Um, after Brexit, they are determined to build on 
the cliche that is banded around the UK often about global Britain. And they're trying to prove that the UK can continue to be a global player since it left the European Union. Um, I think the UK is very fortunate to be hosting it. I think it gives them a really good opportunity to, um, to add value in, in health and climate to the most important things that besets the world at the moment. And I think, uh, so I think it's a, it's a fantastic opportunity, but there is, there are actually quite significant contradictions as well in the UK at the moment about this, because in some ways, as I said, I think the UK can have some pride in the fact it's a leader in, in, in climate change. But it's also the government at the moment has also um, is trying to cut um, the budget for international development. So on the one hand, it, it, it's wanting to show it's, it's, a, it's a global leader and, and leading the way in so many things. But um, on the other hand, some of its domestic policies are, are causing great concern. And the other thing that's also relatively strange and interesting is the choice of, of the location. Cornwall is a beautiful part of the UK. It's very much a holiday destination. It's, it's green and it's verdant and it's, it is absolutely beautiful, but it's also the place that has one of the highest votes for exit. So it's, it's in some ways it's a, an international destination, but on, on the other hand, the locals are, could be said to be sort of, um, inward facing and um, there has always been already been some antagonism about this international meeting taking place there. Uh, thank you, Penny. Now that we have heard the, the UK perspective, um, Stormy, question to you. What role does Germany play in the framework of the G7? Um, I think that, that Germany has played um, in the past and is still playing um, both the role of a anchor and stability factor as well as an agenda setter. Um, our Chancellor Angela, Angela Merkel um, has been, I think, the only leader um, who has hosted uh, two G7 summits and one G20 summit. So she brings along with her team an enormous um, amount of um, experience and also professionality, if that is an English word. Um, and it's a really interesting time for us as well, because um, not only do we have elections coming up um, later this fall, um, we will also be the next presidency chair of the G7. Um, so we are already part, um, we in, in the sense of Germany is part um, of the Troika. So um, it um, already plays an important role um, for the topics on the agenda, but also for ensuring um, that there is continuity um, in the G7 uh, approaches so that initiative are not, now I'm using a German word, Eintagsfliegen, so one day events, um, but will ca be carried over also um, into the next uh, presidency. And that makes, um, makes the role of Germany um, even more important, I would say, um, in the context right now. Thank you. And uh, now for the last round of questions, a little look uh, forward into the future. Uh, Penny, what are your expectations for the summits? Well, I have hopes and I have expectations. I think my hopes are for it not to be fractious. I think, you know, the last few meetings of the G7 have been slightly uncomfortable, um, certainly with President Trump's um, engagement or non-engagement in the forum. And, I, and my other hope is that it comes out of a bit of a coma. I think the last few years, G7 meetings haven't been particularly responsive and haven't pushed very many agendas forward. So that's my hope. My expectations are that there will be, I think, some commitments towards uh, climate change. I think um, there will be a dragging of some commitments and, and certainly a path ahead for the COP26 meeting in November. I think it's also going to be really interesting um, Boris Johnson and the British government have invited three other countries to, to attend. Um, so Australia, India and South Korea. Now, they are all sort of representative, I suppose, of different groupings around the world. And they've also all had different targets when it comes to, to net zero commitments. So, for example, Australia is aiming for net zero, um, but hasn't actually set a timetable for it yet. India is considering um, committing to net zero by 250, but hasn't actually 2000, sorry, 2050, but hasn't quite committed to it. But South Korea has actually signed up um, for a net zero commitment by 2050. So there are steps ahead that I think we can see very clearly. I think it's unlikely there are going to be any decisions on patents for the vaccines, but I do think there is going to be a commitment for some type of support for the global rollout of vaccinations. Right? And I suppose that's my hope and, and expectation. Um, but I suppose ultimately, 
as well as these tangible results, I think are the optics as well. I think it's really important that we see again the engagement of the US. I think it's very important that we see President Biden in Cornwall with his fellow G7 democratic country leaders um, convening, communicating and, and planning for the future. Thank you, Penny. And uh, last question to Stormy. Why do we actually need the G7? Oh, I would say um, it's indispensable um, as a agenda setter, um, really placing um, important issues onto the global governance um, agenda. Um, it is also really important to build up trust and understanding among the G7 um, countries. And uh, a lot of times in the um, uh, for, you only see the big summit in the end, right? And you wonder, is this really also all, all the trouble worth which goes into it? But it's so much more. There are so many working groups working uh, throughout the whole year to find the compromises. There are the engagement groups with civil society, labor, um, and also, um, also, also business groups. Um, so there is a whole process um, underneath the summit um, which takes place and that really helps to build uh, trust and understanding and the third one is it, it, it should be and I hope it will be again um, a forum for concrete action um, where the G7 really commits to something they are going to do which has not been the case over the last three years so I very much hope that um, Penny, your, your, your hopes um, turn into reality and that there will be concrete commitments um, on vaccination and the export of vaccines, that there will be concrete results um, on climate finance. I really hope that there will also be um, a concrete result um, on, on a fair um, and equitable taxation systems. And I really very much hope that um, the hope turns into reality that we will that the G7 will commit to open um, rules-based and free trade um, with a strong multilateral trading system and with a WTO reform which takes us uh, forward. Um, that would be really concrete actions and um, the G G7 shouldn't be um, just a talk shop but a shop um, for our doing things um, and I hope that will be the case. Well, Many thanks to our two experts uh, for giving us their insights and thoughts on the upcoming G7 summit. And we're all excited uh, whether your hopes and expectations will be fulfilled and what will be the results of the summit. Thank you so much.